Well, let's go ahead and, and uh, open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we, we are. We are so completely in love with you. That time of worship was just so good, just so wonderful, and, and it's just so great to, to be your child, Lord, and, and that even though we fall, even though we mess up, and um, that you still love us unconditionally, Lord, that you still care for us, and that you desire for us to get back up and just keep walking, Lord. And so now we, on this beautiful Sunday morning, um, with rain and all, um, we ask that you fill this room here with your spirit, Lord. Speak to us powerfully so that we can hear from you, Lord. Lord remove all distractions and remove all aches and pains and, and um, things that have been keeping us from hearing from you this weekend. We want to dedicate this time completely to you, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're beginning a new chapter here, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. This is a pretty big chapter, and my feeling is that we're probably going to park ourselves here for several weeks um, because it's, there's a lot here, and I don't want to rush through it. So hopefully you understand if we spend a few weeks here. All right, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Starting in verse 1. <coughs> On a Sabbath, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating them. But some of the Pharisees says, why, said, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Haven't you read what David and those who were with him did? When he was hungry, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. He even gave some to those who were with him. Then he told them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching a man uh, and was teaching a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The scribes and Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they could find a charge against him. But he knew their thoughts, and he told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save a life or destroy it? After looking around at them, he told them, stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored. They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. So for over a year now, Jesus has been going around teaching, preaching, and healing. Now, as a result of that, his, popula his popularity had risen and many began to follow, follow him. <coughs> now when the religious leaders went to check him out, he not only didn't meet their expectations, but they didn't believe that someone who behaved like Jesus could be the Messiah. So it was just a matter of time that a clash would occur. And sure enough, it did. This time, it would center around their most important tradition, the Sabbath. So here, ever on the move, Luke tells us that on a Sabbath, Jesus and his followers passed through a grain field. Now, for those, who may not, for those who may not know, a lot of you may know what the Sabbath is and what it's all about. There may be some who may not know. But for those who don't, the Sabbath is the seventh day that's set aside as a day of rest and it's a holy day by God and it's holy by God. The Sabbath was first mentioned in the Genesis creation narrative found in Genesis chapter 2 and is also one of the Ten Commandments. Now typically Jews and more so Orthodox Jews observe 
Sab Sabbath on Saturdays. That's, again, their holy day, and that's the day of rest. They don't do anything, and they just, I know some that just don't even do any, get on uh, social media, don't watch TV, <coughs> or any of that. That's, they're just time, it's their time with their family, their time uh, getting into God's Word, studying, whatever it may be. But it's just a holy day set aside for God. Now, on this particular Sabbath, almost subco subconsciously, the disciples began picking off a few, few, uh, a few grains, rubbing, rubbing them in their hands to remove the husks, and snacking on the kernels. Now, although this grain field may, not have, may have belonged to somebody else, this really wasn't considered stealing. What they were doing was known as gleaning. And according to the provision for the poor of the land given in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25, this was allowable. However, the issue the Pharisees has, had wasn't that they were gleaning. The issue they had was that they viewed what the apostles were doing, what the disciples were doing, I'm sorry, was that they were working on the Sabbath. They were working on that holy day. You see, according to the strict oral restrictions or interpretations they had collected and enforced, they saw those actions as threshing, winnowing, and preparing food, which, again, according to their extra rule books that they had, um, it wasn't allowed. Thus, they were guilty of breaking the law by working on the holy day of rest. Now, none of the Gospels say that Jesus was actually participating. But the Lord actually stepped up here. He stepped up and took full responsibility, which reminds me, it's just a good example of leadership. <coughs> he took full responsibility and responded to their accusation with an Old Testament example. Using an incident from the life of David, in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 21, Jesus showed the law of the Sabbath was never intended to forbid uh, a work of necessity. In that story, David satisfied the needs of his, of his hungry army by entering the house of God and eating the bread of the presence. The bread, of pres the bread of the presence is also known as the showbread. Now, the showbread was compromised of 12 loaves, which represented one for each tribe of Israel. And it stood on the table in the holy place, in the tabernacle, and then in the temple. Fresh bread was put on the table each Sabbath. And according to Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5 through 9, only the priests were allowed to eat it. Now, David's intent wasn't to purposely disobey the law. All he was simply doing was putting the human needs of his men above ritual law. And in the end, God's priests cooperated with him. You see, here's the thing. The law concerning the showbread was ne never intended to be so slavishly followed as to permit God's king to starve. The interesting thing is that the Pharisees were thoroughly immersed, immersed in the scriptures and knew all about these stories. They knew them like their back of the hand. They must have read them a thousand times. But the thing is, although they may have read it, a bunch of times, they completely miss the meaning. So too, like the Pharisees, we can be guilty of reading the word over and over again, thinking we know what it's saying, but missing the very essence of the meaning. The Lord wants to show us more in his word than we presently know. But it takes an open mind and a tender heart to receive it. For instance, 
When Samuel heard his name being called in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9, uh, Eli told him to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You see, too often we just say the opposite. Listen, Lord, while your servant speaks, uh, listen, Lord, while your servant speaks, as we approach the word with our presuppositions or our legalistic traditions. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, we read that Ezra prepared his own heart to seek the Lord and his law before he taught it to others. And so likewise, this ought to be us as well. We ought to prepare ourselves before we go out, before we, we get into his word. We ought to just, our hearts need to be softened, our minds need to, that's why occasionally you hear me, or you hear me pray occasionally that, you know, Lord, soften our hearts, soften our minds, so we may receive your word. Because it's hard when that soil is so hard, and when it's impacted for him to speak to us. And, and I've always believed that it could be part of the message, it could be a word, a sentence in his word, but he wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to each and every one of you personally. You just have to be open to him. That's why whatever distractions are, are keeping your mind away, whatever's going on, you know, make an effort just to drop it and just pay attention to what, to, to what, go, to what God wants to say to you. Well, just like then, well, here now we have a similar situation. Christ and his disciples were hungry, but the Pharisees would rather see them starve than to pick up grain on the Sabbath. However, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. By making this statement, he was identifying himself as the Messiah and, listen closely, the master of the Sabbath who had established it. In other words, it was he who gave the law in the first place. He was there in the beginning, and therefore he's free to do on it and with it whatever he wanted to. And not only that, but no one was better qualified to interpret its true spiritual meaning and to say, uh, to, I'm sorry, to, there's no one better than he to interpret the true spiritual meaning and to save it from misunderstanding. Here's our challenge as Christians today. Our challenge is to make sure that we don't go back and misinterpret what Jesus had already interpreted. For example here, the key point Jesus was making here was, is the importance of displaying love and compassion to the needy than keeping human institutions and traditions. Some Christians are so adamant about the day, the time, the location a church service needs to be <coughs> that they make a big deal out about it. They make a big deal about it. Oh, we've got to meet Sundays at six in the morning. We've, church has got to be um, uh, three times during the day and, and once, in the, once in the evening. Uh, all kinds of things they're, they, they're used to or, um, they be, or they've been used to. But, or some people, actually some denominations will just meet on Saturdays. That's, that's the days they meet for church. Um, some churches meet Saturdays, Sundays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. Um, pretty much every day out of the week, there's a church service. But again, some are so adamant about how it needs to be that they make a big deal about it. However, the truth is, God's more concerned about what's in the heart of those who are in the church than when and where they go to church. You can have a small church like this and, and everyone just is in love with the Lord and has a heart for it. And he, he knows it and he's in love with it. And it he's, he's happy about it. And you could also have a church where there's thousands of people there and everyone's heart is far from him. He's concerned. He wants, he's more concerned about what's in the heart of 
those who are in a church, whether it's Saturday or Sunday or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever it may be, she's more concerned about what's in the heart of those people than where they go to church. This also applies to matters of social controversy. Controversy. People will use Jesus' words to justify hateful actions and moral behavior. When the fact is, the Lord is always, has always been, uh, the Lord always faithfully upheld God's clear moral standard and never condoned violence or hatred toward anyone. Amen. You may have heard or seen examples of this on TV of so-called street preachers or churches going out and, and, and saying or doing some really horrible things. And they justify it by pulling out verses in the Bible or having some misunderstanding about what a passage or a scripture says. But again, this is an example of how Jesus already interpreted something and now they're going back and misinterpreting what he interpreted. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. And again, the point is we have to be careful with our own actions and behaviors. We have to be careful about, you know, we have to decide if we're going to be followers of Christ or political commentators, political activists. Because sometimes, a lot of times, the two don't go hand in hand. You know, we'll begin, you know, I know that it begins sometimes in my heart. I have strong opinions politically, but, oh, I've had them before, but what ends up happening is I start feeling these feelings of anger and hatred towards those who don't have the same as, as mine, or even just social issues. Like, for instance, people will be so much against abortion or against um, gay marriage that they will, that's what they focus on and their anger gets so intense that it comes out as hatred. And I believe the Bible tells us that we're supposed to love all people. We're supposed to love these people and bring them to Christ. And it's Christ who changes them. It's not us. We just lead people to Christ. We plant the seeds, and He makes it grow. So again, we need to be careful when it comes to these things. Now Luke then tells us about a second Sabbath, a second Sabbath incident that occurred when Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. It says that while he was there, the scribes and Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal a man with a shriveled right hand on the Sabbath. By now, though, they had good reason to believe that he would, that he would and were looking to find more evidence against him. You, those of you who feel withered, paralyzed, and, and are struggling, know this. When Jesus comes into the meeting place, he is always drawn toward the one who is hurting the most. That is so unlike us, so unlike our character. We tend to seek those who are doing the best, the happiest, the spiritual ones, but not Jesus. He found the one who was experiencing paralysis because he always, he's always drawn to the one with the greatest need. And he's drawn, if this is you, he's being drawn to you. It's up to you whether you want to say no thanks, you want to say yes, Lord, I need you. Now, Jesus knew their thoughts. And he called upon the man to get up and stand in the middle of the synagogue so everyone could see. The Lord then asks, asks, asked his critics, <coughs> <coughs> Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath 
or to do evil, to save a life or destroy it. Now, if they answered correctly, they would have to say that it was right to do good on the Sabbath and wrong to do harm. So if it was right to do good, then he'd be doing good by saving the man. However, if it was wrong to do evil on the Sabbath, then they'd be guilty of breaking the Sabbath themselves by thinking, by plotting in their minds to kill or destroy Jesus. So do you see what he did here? The Lord completely turned it around on them so, uh, so they would see uh, on them, so to see if, if what they were thinking was lawful on the Sabbath. So after looking around and hearing crickets, Jesus directed the man to stretch out his withered hand. And when he did, it was completely restored. When he told, when he told this man to stretch forth his hand, the man could have easily have said, I, I can't. I can't. I'm, I'm paralyzed. But because God's commandments are his enablements, the moment he decided to obey, he was able to obey. Husbands, love your wives, the word says in Ephesians 5.25. But, but I can't, we say. You don't know my wife. You don't know my situation. I can't. I'm paralyzed. See, we can either make our lists of why we can't obey, or we can say, Lord, you say to love my wife, and I will, knowing that as I do, you will enable me to do that which you've asked me to do. Does that make sense? The Lord is the one who enables you. If he asks you to do something, he's the one who enables you to do it. Now, some would also argue or say that Jesus could have waited a few hours until the Sabbath was over, or he could have healed the man in private. But because he wanted to emphasize the fact that there's never a wrong day to do something good, he did it openly and immediately. But do you see, instead of praising God, that this man was healed, this man was saved, and just being happy for him, rejoicing for this man, the Pharisees only saw it as a deliberate violation of the Sabbath traditions. He was, although Jesus had turned it around on them so they can see if what they were saying or doing was really lawful, they they may have, but they were just so stubborn. It was so hard-hearted. They were like, uh, I don't care. You still violated the Sabbath. You still messed up. And you're guilty. You're the one guilty of breaking the Sabbath. That was just their heart. That was just their mindset that they had. How sad. How sad when these people, the truth is right in front of them. They have the, the ability or that the, that change is right before them but instead they kick it away and say no you you're the one with the problem we have to be careful also about having those kind of attitudes and if we're told especially if it comes from the Lord that there's an issue there's a problem we have to be open about it you may not accept it right away you may have an problem with it right away, but I would say rather than responding, talking back, or, or, or just chew on it, dwell on it, go home and be honest with yourselves. And yeah, ask yourselves, is this really an issue? And the Lord will make it clear to you. If it is, see, there's so many things, so many pockets and corners, secret compartments into our, in our own hearts that sometimes 
We don't see them. We don't know about them. We don't know about them. And what the Lord does, he goes in there and he starts to point them out. He starts to put a flashlight on there and says, see this? And many times we're like, Lord, yeah, I don't want to see that. That's supposed to stay closed. That's supposed to be hidden. That's, no one was supposed to see that. You weren't supposed to see that. The Lord, again, he knows everything. He knows all about your heart. And he wants to get rid of the junk that's in there that shouldn't be in there. The stuff that's keeping you from having a deeper, closer relationship with him. Again, rather than being happy, they were upset with him. Nevertheless, I, wanna, I want you to notice two things that were achieved here. The Lord made it clear, number one, the Lord made it clear that God instituted a Sabbath for man's good. And secondly, the Lord saw a need in this man and showed compassion by healing him. This is theology in action. He knew, the Lord knew what his father, what God meant and proved it by taking action and doing what was right, even though for everyone else may have seemed wrong. Again, that is theology in action. Well, filled with rage that Jesus had outwitted them again, they started discussing ways to get rid of this lawbreaker who claimed to be the Lord of their precious day. But the thing is, Jesus wasn't trying to reform the Sabbath. He was trying to show them that they were missing the whole point about how to approach God. A legalist wants to debate which rules are the correct rules. We, however, want to emphasize that it isn't based on what we do for him, but it's based on what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Now, before I begin, next week we're going to begin the section on the Beatitudes. But before I begin that long um, section, um, I want to first cover the next two paragraphs. So if you still have your Bibles open, follow along as I pick up and read from verse 12. Luke chapter 6. Verse 12. During those days, he went out to the, to the mountain to pray and spent all night in prayer to God. When daylight came, he summoned his disciples, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called a zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. After coming down with them, he stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all of Judea and, Jer and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and be healed of their, of their diseases. And those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. In the world of technology, this, there's a new development called hypersonic sound, HSS. The inventor Elwood Woody Norris has engineered sound waves to travel like a laser beam for about 150 yards. Now this illustration was probably old, so there may be improvements to this, but this allows sounds to be heard by a person in a particular place, but not by those immediately around them. You could be listening to music or specific instructions while those standing next to you would be left in total silence. If you move out of the tightly formed path of these unique sound waves, you too will be unaware of any noise. 
God's communication with us is very similar to these sound waves. We must be in the right place to hear the Holy Spirit. And when we're, and when uh, there's a message and, sorry, when, and the message will be clear. If we move away from the pathway of his voice and we become unaware of the fact that he is communicating with us, we'll consequently miss the message. See, Jesus knew the importance of listening. And that's why he did that often. That's why he went by himself to a deserted place, to a mountaintop, wherever it was, just to get away from everybody and just to spend time with his father, spend time in prayer. He wanted to be led by his father. He wanted to hear from him. He wanted to know what his father had to say about what to do, where to go, who to pick. So that's what we see him doing here. You see, the time had come for our Lord to decide how his mission would continue when he was done fulfilling his earthly ministry. And a decision, and a decision this big meant, un, meant uninterrupted communion with his father. So after spending all night on a mountain, Jesus was led to appoint 12 men from all his followers for the special work of apostles. The idea behind the ancient Greek word for apostle is, about, is, is ambassador. The Greek, word for apost the Greek word is apostolos, which means sent one and describes someone who represents another and has a message from their sender. In this broader sense, Jesus was also an apostle according to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. There it says, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Here, though, these apostles would be the men that build the future church on the foundation that Jesus would lay. Well, these, this is who they are, and uh, this is what we know. Simon, who was also named Peter, he was the son of Jonah and one of the most prominent of the disciples. <coughs> Andrew, his brother, it was Andrew who introduced Peter to the Lord. James, the son of Zebedee, he was privileged to go with Peter and John to the Mount of Transfiguration, and uh, he was killed by Herod Agrippa I. Then there's John, the, son of, the other son of Zebedee. Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. It was John who wrote the gospel and the epistles bearing his name and the book of Revelation. Then there's Philip, a native of Bethsaida, who introduced Nathaniel to Jesus, not to be confused with Philip, the evangelist in the book of Acts. Bartholomew, or Bart, uh, Generally understood to be another name for Nathaniel, he is mentioned only in the listings of the Twelve. Matthew, who we read about last, uh, last couple of weeks, the tax collector, also named Levi, he wrote the first gospel. Thomas, also called twin, he said that he would not believe that the Lord had risen until he, had until he saw conclusive evidence. This is Doubting Thomas, or otherwise known as Doubting Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus, he may have been the one who held a place of responsibility in the church of Jerusalem after James, the son of Zebedee, had been killed by Herod. Simon, called the Zealot, little known is, about, it is known about him as far as the sacred record is concerned. Judas, the son of James, possibly the same as Jude, the author of the epistle, and commonly believed to be uh, Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus. And you can look that up in Matthew chapter 10 and Mark chapter 3. And then you have, finally, Judas Iscariot, presumed to be from Cariath in Judah, and thus one of the apostles who wasn't from Galilee. And Luke also points out that he became a traitor. Now what's interesting and what we have to keep in mind is that according to John chapter 6, verse 64, 
Jesus knew who he was from the beginning, the one who would betray him. So as a person with real human emotion, this must have been really difficult for him. This must have been a really difficult choice to make, even after having prayed about it. A man once asked a theologian, why did Jesus choose Judas Iscariot to be his disciple? The teacher replied, I don't know, but I have an even harder question. Why did Jesus choose me? As you can see, these men were an interesting group of ordinary men with different backgrounds, different vocations, and different personalities, and who perfectly illustrated what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. Let me read that to you real quick. There it says, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many no of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. Do you see, these were the kind of men that were chosen. The thing that made them great was their relationship to Jesus and their commitment to him. This ought to be an encouragement for us today. After all, if God could use them, can he not use us? You don't have to be a theologian. You don't even have to be a good person to, to, to be called. I've met and talked to former drug addicts and criminals who were once living a life that was heading towards death and hell and are now being used mightily by God because they've answered the call. You don't have to be a certain age to be called. You can be young, you can be old. The Lord can call you. You can be, you, you can even be any, a man, woman, any, any. If the Lord calls you, he will call you and he will use you. He calls you for a reason. And guess what? If he calls you, and if he, well, actually, if he called you, he's the one that's responsible. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Again, he's responsible. He calls you and he's responsible. Well, after Jesus had selected his disciples, <coughs> Luke then tells us that he came down with them and stood at a level place. There, a great number of people from different parts of the region met him. We're told this crowd was multifaceted. Disciples, southerners from Judea came down, representatives from Jerusalem, the capital, evidently including religious leaders who had been hounding Jesus and persons from the Phoenician cities of Tyre, and Sidon, perhaps even Gentiles. Now, there was two purposes that drove people to travel long and difficult distances to see Jesus. <coughs> they wanted to hear his authoritative teaching and to be healed of their diseases or spiritual oppression by unclean spirits. Now, because power was coming out from him, all who touched Jesus were healed. So what we see here is a clear demonstration of both his power and his compassion. It was also a reminder to his newly appointed assistants that their job was to share his love and power with a needy world. And now as Christians, as 
believers, as followers of Christ, if you're called, then that's what he wants us to do. He just wants us to, as I mentioned earlier, just to share the love of Christ. He wants us to just lead people to him, whether it's by word or action. You don't have to necessarily be a, a strong speaker evangelist. And you've heard me mention this before. Sometimes it's just your behavior or actions. People will begin to will see that there's something different about you and they will start to ask you, want to talk to you, hey, what's going on with you? You used to party, you used to drink, you used to cuss, you used to do all these things and now you don't. Well, why not? Because Jesus saved me. Because Jesus, I understood, Jesus came into my life and changed me. And that will open up the door for you to share the gospel and to share with people what Christ can do for them. Our heart should be for the lost. Jesus didn't look around and say, oh, too bad for that person, that person's a lost cause. Our heart should be for the lost. And if it's not, then we have to re-examine what's, what's in there. And those of you who have close friends and you really care for them, you really love them, and you've never once shared with them that you're a Christian or shared with them the gospel, what kind of love is that? If you know who Christ is and if he really saved you and you know for a fact, you really believe that when a person dies, they're going to go to hell, what kind of love is that if you're not sharing that with those you're closest to? Is that person really your bro? Is that person really your girl? You know, is that... If you, they don't know anything about Jesus or maybe have a misunderstanding about Jesus, are you helping them? Are you leading them? Because if not, what is that going to say about you you know, yeah, you're saved, but you know, you left that you left the, your friend to roast. I don't know. Again, that's I don't see that as love. So again, our we have a responsibility too now as followers as Christians. And I'll end here. And like I said, next next week we're gonna really start covering these beatitudes, and these are beautiful. This next section is really beautiful. I would encourage you to, to read on and to, to read it yourselves and study it. And then, um, and then maybe you can compare notes next week. I, I don't know, but um, really I want to encourage you to, to, to start reading that section. But maybe there are just some of you who are hearing this message and you're like, wow, I never saw it this way. I never saw the Sabbath. In that way and, and I've been so stuck in the way things ought to be that yeah the Lord right now is really convicting me you know well it's never too late to turn back to repent and just come to him maybe the Lord again is just telling you stop worrying about the little small issues and just just be concerned about the main point and just know what the main point is the you know, and that's just to love. Love others, have compassion. And maybe that's where you need the Lord just to, to work on your heart, to give you more love and compassion. Well, ask Him, come to Him. Ask Him, Lord, give me more love, give me more compassion. Especially towards that group, that group of people that just always gets on my nerves. Let me just love them. Give me that heart. Maybe the Lord's calling you right now. And he's tugging into you, he's tugging at your heart and wants you to come to him. Wants you to is calling you now to 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 follow him. Will you answer that call? Or will you say, No thanks? No thanks, Lord, another day. You know, I, I've been there before and I know what that tug is like. So 
whether you're here, you're watching, you're listening, come to him and let him radically just change your life, change your perspective, your worldview. And he will fill you with a love so great that it's just going to overfill and it's going to overflow and it's just going to pour out onto others. And those you thought were the most unlovable, you will just start to have a heart for them. You'll be surprised that, you know, some people, you have, uh, there may be some people out there that may have never had any kind of, uh, or may have never had a heart for kids. But after Jesus, after being born again, after being accepting Jesus into their heart, now they just have a, a love, a pure love for these kids, and they just want them to know more about Jesus. Well, maybe the Lord wants to give you a heart for somebody or some people that, so you can minister to them. Well, now's your opportunity. If you've never accepted the Lord into your heart, and you're ready to receive him into your heart and you're ready to, you want to become born again. You want to know for a fact that when you breathe your last breath, you will be with him in heaven. You will be face to face with him and he will, he will be embraced by him and you'll just be with him for all eternity. If that's you, wherever you're at, close your head and, or close your eyes and bow your head And with all your heart, pray this, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I know that I've blown it and I, I confess it all to you, Lord. I believe that Jesus came on the cross to die for my sins. I believe he is Lord. I confess him as Lord. And so I come to the cross right now and lay all my sins before him. I believe that now you're, that you've wiped the slate clean, Lord, and that my sins are forgiven. I accept your forgiveness. Help me to walk with you. Fill me with your spirit. And help me to fall more in love with you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who prayed that and you want to know more information, you want to know what your next steps or your walk is going to be or what you, you know, we have recommendations. We want to lead you on how to, want to help you on your next steps. Let us know, call us. But uh, as I mentioned, there's, just be aware here, those of us that are listening here, just be aware what the Lord is, wants us to know, what, what he wants us to understand here and, and uh, let's be a also aware of our calling it's a beautiful calling at times it's bumpy it's hard as many of you know but in the end it's worth it and those of you who, who are in need of that special healing from him understand that sometimes he will other times he won't but it's all for a purpose. He didn't heal. Remember, Paul always had that thorn in his flesh. But it made him, it drew him even closer to God. So even though, again, you may not be 100%, he wants to, the, the fact of the matter is that he wants to heal your heart. So allow him to do that. And in the end, again, there, something great and awesome is awaiting you in heaven as well. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. <coughs> thank you for giving us um, 
these stories of what occurred on the two Sabbaths, Lord, and that we just apply what, what you've told us here, Lord. We just pay attention to the things that really matter, not to the small, insignificant things, Lord. Help us to, again, just to fall more in love with you, Lord, to know you more, to understand you more. Pray for those who are, who have been called and for those who are being called, Lord. I pray you strengthen them. I pray that you are, that you be with them, that you sanctify them, that you fill them, Lord, just also with your spirit. They may walk in truth and boldness, Lord, and just always give you, you the glory for everything that is done through them. And heal those who are hurting, Lord, those in pain. May they feel your touch, your warm embrace, and Heal them now, Lord. Give them the comfort they need, the physical and emotional and spiritual comfort they're looking for. Thank you again for this time. I pray you protect everyone here. Watch over everyone's um, week as they go about work and school at home. We pray for those who are celebrating, Lord, and pray that you just continue to Show them how much you mean to them, how important they are to you. Bless us next time of fellowship, Lord. We love you, praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.